Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic fall so far. Uh, before you know it, the holidays and winter will be here, and I don't know about you, but I can hardly wait. Winter is a great time to cozy up with a good book. Now, the last time we were together, I recommended some adventure books to you. Maybe you checked some of those out. Maybe you didn't. Maybe adventure books just aren't for you. That's okay. Today, I wanna to talk to you about historical fiction and a little bit about that genre and share with you some of my favorites. You know, when I was in school, I didn't like history at all. History and math were actually my least favorite subjects. But now I love history and I love reading about it, which is why historical fiction is one of my new favorite genres. Historical fiction books are set in a real place, in a culturally recognizable time, right? The events in the book, however, can be based on true fact and also from the author's imagination. So most often it is based on real things that happened, but part of the story is made up. The book characters can be actual people, or again, totally fictional characters. Most often, it's a combination of both. This book, Nothing Else But Miracles, written by Kate Elvis, is one that I just recently read, and it's a book about a girl whose dad was drafted into the war and forced to leave his children behind. Dory is 12 years old and now living in an apartment with only her two brothers, now that her dad is at war. Her mother actually died from tuber tuberculosis when she was only um, six years old. So she and her brothers are surviving on their own, but it's tough. Dory misses her dad and her mom, right? And she has a lot of extra responsibility now. Um, she has to help take care of her brother, Pike, who sometimes gets on her nerves and who sometimes she forgets to pick up after school. Um, but she also has to be careful about anyone finding out about her dad being away and then living on their own in the apartment. Because if the officials found that out, then they might split the um, three of them up and send them to orphanages, right? So it's a really tough time for um, Dory and her brothers right now. But it's okay in the beginning because they live in such a close-knit neighborhood that everyone in the neighborhood kind of looks af out after one another. Right? So they are kind of protected by their neighbors and by their friends, even after their dad goes to war. In fact, every Wednesday night, Mr. Caputo um, from the restaurant down the street gives them free seafood stew and a cold glass of milk, right, just to help them out. So they know one night a week they don't have to cook. They don't have to worry about being hungry. So everyone's looking out for one another. Their landlord is really cool, so they're not, he's not going to turn them in. But... Shortly after the dad leaves for war, their nice, cool, kind landlord passes away. And the new guy who comes in, let's just say he's not as kind. So what will happen to Dory and her brothers? Um, trouble kind of starts to brew and life is already tough for them, but it gets even tougher. You have to read it to find out what happens to Dory and her brothers, Fish and Pike. Um, and I think if you do, you won't be disappointed. I highly recommend this title. Again, it's one that I just recently read and I couldn't put down. Do you think the characters in that book, Dory, Fish, and Pike, are unusual names? I thought so too. They're actually all relating to the water, to the ocean. Her dad's name, I think, was Hurley which means something uh, related to water. Her mother, who passed away from tuberculosis, her name was um, Cordelia, which means daughter of the ocean. Dory, I think I marked this actually. Dory means gift of the ocean. Now Dory's the main character in the book. Um, Fish, well, self-explanatory, and Pike, her little brother who's eight years old, Pike is a type of fish. So it's kind of neat that they're all named after, um, after the water. I think her parents actually met um, 
around the water while her dad was like working on boats or something. So just a great book. Again, the author is Kate Albus. If your school library doesn't have it, well, then you know where to find it. Come visit us at your uh, Bethel Park local library if you're here watching this in Bethel Park. If you are elsewhere watching this video, check your local library because chances are they will have it as well. Okay, so I have a lot of other books that I want to tell you about, but first, let's read a chapter together from this book, Ollie Escapes the Great Chicago Fire. I told you last time that you're never too old to be read to, and that is so true, right? So I want to introduce this book to you by reading a chapter aloud, and maybe it'll hook you in. So I just want you to sit back and relax, close your eyes if you'd like to, maybe rest your head on your desk, and kind of just take some time to relax and listen to the first chapter of this story. Ollie Escapes the Great Chicago Fire. This takes place October 8th, 1871. Almost finished, Ollie, Mrs. Burnham called as she came into the parlor. Yes, ma'am, Ollie said, glancing up from the desk. <clears throat> We're just finishing up Leo's lessons. The Burnham's five-year-old son, Leo, looked very relieved about that. He was slouched next to Ollie in his fine mahogany chair, kicking at the legs and sticking out his lip. I'm tired of lessons, mother, Leo said. Ollie ruffled Leo's hair. Ollie was proud of himself. He had only been working for the Burnhams for six months, and he was getting better all the time at learning how to manage all his daily duties, which included tending to Leo and giving him his lessons. By now, Ollie figured he was almost as good at his duties as grown-ups were, even though he was only 12. He knew how important it was to keep his job, and that meant keeping the Burnhams happy. We can end for today, ma'am, Ollie said. Leo did well. Wonderful, said Mrs. Burnham. And did you finish polishing the silver? Yes, ma'am. Ollie stood and helped Leo to his feet. I'll get Leo to bed soon. I just need to clean the wagon first. Morris put the horse away already. Thank you. I'll come kiss him goodnight in a little bit, said Mrs. Burnham, bustling off. Will you tell me a story, Ollie? Leo asked, gleeful now. Leo adored Ollie and looked up to him like a big brother. I sure will, said Ollie. I'll come up as soon as I've cleaned the wagon. At least they're a nice family, Ollie thought to himself as he rounded the outside of the Burnham's mansion to where the family's wagon stood. He could see their groom, Morris, leading the horse to a small barn. The Burnham house sat in the Washington Square Park neighborhood of Chicago, near the Mall on Ogden Mansion at Walton Street, which was just as impressive as the Burnhams. Ollie had never thought he'd see a place this grand, let alone live in it. He knew he was lucky that the Burnhams had taken him in. He knew plenty of orphans that hadn't fared as well. Ollie's dad had died a few years ago in the Civil War, a war between America's northern and southern states while fighting for the Union Army in the North. Then, a year ago, his mom had died of a disease that attacks the lungs called tuberculosis. Ollie's father had been a carriage driver for the Burnhams, who were charitable people. When Ollie's mother died, they kindly gave Ollie a job helping the footman and the housekeeper. And once they saw how good he was with Leo, they expanded his duties to taking care of Leo as well. Ollie squinted around the neighborhood the huge elm trees around Washington Square swayed in the hot, dry wind blowing up from the southwest. It hadn't rained in months. He nervously scanned the sky. Chicago was a busy, bustling place full of wooden buildings and raised wooden sidewalks. Many of the buildings had roofs made of tar or shingles, which caught fire easily. There had been a lot of fires in the city lately, more than 20 in just the past week. It was because of the dry air and because of all the wood. Ollie swept out the wagon, making sure there were no traces of dust or dirt, and then came back to find Leo waiting for him at the foot of the stairs. Mr. Burnham walked in and gave his young son a smile. Did you learn your numbers with Ollie today, Leo? Mr. Burnham asked. I learned all the way to 100, Leo said proudly, but mostly we did reading. Good boy, off to bed with you then said Mr. Burnham. Mother and I will be in to say goodnight in a moment. Ollie led Leo upstairs to his room and got him dressed for bed. 
Don't forget my bedtime story, Leo said. Ollie smiled. He set the oil lamp he'd brought up with him onto the table. And then he started telling Leo one of the stories that his mother used to tell him, an old fable with witches, kings, and queens. Leo listened with wide eyes. Ollie never told Leo, but his heart always felt heavy when he told these stories. They made him think of his little sister, Eliza. When Ollie had found employment with the Burnhams, Eliza, who was only eight, had been put into a home for orphans a few blocks from the courthouse. Ollie had wanted to beg the Burnhams to also take in Eliza, but he knew he was lucky to get the position he had. He could not ask for their charity. The Burnhams had given Ollie a chance, but it wasn't common for wealthy families to also adopt the siblings of their servants. He knew several siblings who had been separated after their parents died. Often, older siblings were able to work while younger ones were sent to orphanages. There just weren't many places for young orphans to go. So it was up to Ollie to save Eliza. He had made a plan to work as much as he could and get an education for himself. When he had saved up enough money, he would collect Eliza from the orphanage and would take care of her. He was all she had. The Burnhams let Ollie visit Eliza every Sunday for an hour, so at least he still got to see her. But he missed her badly, and he knew that she missed him too. Little Leo fell asleep before Ollie could finish, which often happened. Ollie tucked him in, grabbed the oil lamp, and left the room, tiptoeing across the wooden floor. He headed to his own room, climbing the last flight of stairs to the small space in the attic. Ollie sank down in his little chair. His bones felt tired, like they always did at the end of every day. There was a photograph of Eliza on his bedside table. It had been taken after their parents died. Eliza wore their mother's beloved silver bracelet on her wrist in the photo, but she had no smile. She had always been so lighthearted when both her parents were alive. But ever since they had died, it was like Eliza's light had gone out. The resolve hardened in Ollie's heart. He would get her out of that orphanage and keep her with him, and somehow he'd also find a way to continue his education. He'd earned enough money to take care of Eliza and make sure she was never alone and scared again. That was his plan. He pulled out the book he borrowed from Mr. Burnham's wonderful library, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Reading was one of the few luxuries Ollie had. Mr. Burnham knew how much Ollie loved to read, so he let Ollie borrow books. So far, Ollie had read Mark the Match Boy, Little Women, Great Expectations, and Uncle Tom's Cabin. Ollie must have fallen asleep as he read because the next thing he knew, he was slumped in his chair and the book had fallen to the floor. His first thought was that he'd done what the servants were never supposed to do, which was fall asleep into the, in their uniform. Servants couldn't risk getting them wrinkled or torn. But there was a frantic knocking on the door. Ollie! Josephine, one of the housemaids, burst into the room. Ollie! Her face was pale and frightened. Ollie, there's another fire down south. The family is packing to leave. And that's where we're going to stop. That's the end of chapter one. Okay, so the fire hits and 12-year-old Ollie needs to get out and he needs to get Leo out too, right? They need to escape. And what about his little sister? Of course, he wants to go find and save her too, right? Maybe get her out before the fire hits or at least after it's burning through, can he find her in the wreckage? He has to save her, right? All they have is each other. So the title of the book is Ollie Escapes the Great Chicago Fire, which means we could probably assume that he escapes, that he lives, but what about Leo? What about his sister Eliza? What about the Burnhams, the family uh, he works for? Do they make it out okay? This is a great book too, um, boys and girls, and it will teach you more about the Great Chicago Fire that again started in 1871. It killed about 300 people, but destroyed miles of the city, which left a lot of like buildings and houses were just burnt to the ground. So, so many people, thousands of people were left homeless. If you like this book, 
There's a whole series. Some of them are written by different authors, but they're all part of the same Smithsonian series. So check those out. Again, your school library may have those, but if not, come visit me at the public library. There's also the I Survive series, which I know your school library has. Don't forget these uh, to check these out. These are by Lara Tarshish, another great way to learn about history through fun adventure type stories. Now, I told you that I like to go back to the 1930s and 40s World War II era. But another moment in our country's history, in our world's history, that absolutely fascinates me is the sinking of the Titanic. Um, this was actually the ship that was supposed to be unsinkable, right? This great, huge, fantastic, brand new ship was supposed to be unsinkable. Uh, but in 1912, it hit an iceberg and it went down. Hazel Rothberry is a 12-year-old girl. Most of the characters in these books are 12 years old, huh? So right around your age, a little bit older, right? But I would say like fifth or sixth grade. Um, Hazel Rothberry is living in England, okay? And I want you to think about, you know, your, where you are right now in your life at this age. And I want you to think about the biggest responsibility you've ever had, okay? Now I want you to think about if your responsibility was to take care of your family, not only to take care of them, but to save them. That's a pretty big responsibility, wouldn't you say? Probably a bigger responsibility than you've had to deal with thus far in your life, right? But not for Hazel Roth Rothberry. She's 12 years old and that's kind of the challenge, the responsibility that she's facing. Uh, she's living in England and her father passes away and there's really no other way for the family to earn money. So they are really struggling. Um, it's hard for them to even find enough money to scrape together to put food on the table. So as much as she doesn't want to, Hazel's mother asks her to go to America, right? To take the Titanic over and to go to the United States and um, find work in a factory because maybe then she would earn enough money to send back to them just to help make ends meet. Now Hazel dreams of being a journalist. She's very curious and she loves to write. So she dreams of being a journalist and has nothing to, wants nothing to do with the factory, right? But she loves her family more than anything, so she bravely says yes and follows her mom's request. So her mom packs her some food, she packs up her suitcase, and she heads off to board the Titanic at 12 years old. Imagine traveling alone like that. As an adult, I still don't love traveling alone, right? So I can imagine how scary it would be for a 12-year-old. Again, she loves her family, she has to be brave, she does it. When she gets to the ticket counter, however, she realizes that her mother did not give her enough money to cost the cover of the ticket. She thought she did, but she was slightly shy of what it would cost to, for her to ride as a third class passenger on the ship. And that's the lowest um, class, that's like the cheapest ticket you could get. She still didn't have enough money for it. So what is she gonna do? What would you do if you were in Hazel's shoes? Again, she finds that courage deep within and she finds a way to get on the Titanic. Little does she know that Titanic is gonna sink only a few days later after hitting an iceberg and sinking in the Atlantic Ocean about three hours after the hit. Little does she know. But what do you think happens to Hazel up until that time? How does she fare on this ship all by herself? Does she meet anyone? Does she make any friends? You don't have to read it to find out. She uncovers a lot. She's, like I said, she's very curious. So she actually discovers like a little bit of a mystery, um, some secrets that are hidden on the ship, and she starts to unravel those. This is all before, of course, um, they hit the iceberg. But you can read about her adventures and whether or not she survives in Iceberg by Jennifer Nielsen. There were some like almost 3,000 passengers on the Titanic, boys and girls. And do you know only 709 of them survived? Yeah, the Titanic's a pretty interesting topic to read up on. All right. 
I also just recently read Brother's Keeper by Julie Lee. Now I said I read a lot of World War II books. This one is actually about the Korean War, which people often refer to as the Forgotten War because it's not written or talked about as much as Civil War, World War I, World War II, right? But it's just as important and it was just as devastating, especially for the people living at that time. So the main character in this book, um, Sora, is living in North Korea with her family, uh, mom and dad and two brothers. And um, then North Korea invades South Korea. So in this book, North Korea and South Korea um, are at odds with one another and they begin fighting. Just like um, the North and the South in the United States during the Civil War, right? This time North Korea and South Korea are fighting against one another. They live in North Korea. And as soon as everything starts to go down, the dad wants to get out of there, right? He says, we should pack up and we should leave. But the mom disagrees. And so there's some tension right within the family there um, as to what they should do. Mom says, no, this is our home. We shouldn't leave it. This will pass. We must wait it out. So in the beginning, dad wants to please mom. Um, so they stay for a little while and they decide to hide dad under the ground. Now, why would they do that? He doesn't want to go off fighting in this war that he doesn't agree with. But that's what's going to happen if they find him. He's going to be forced to go fight. So they hide Sora's dad under the ground. Imagine being buried alive. That's what they have to do. And he stays like that for a couple weeks, coming out only at night to get water, to go to the bathroom. So he'll sometimes take a quick shower and shave just so that he can feel somewhat normal. And then he goes right back down underground again. And this is so dangerous and so risky. They feel like they have no choice. So he only comes out at night when it's pitch black and he thinks that he, it will be safe. Okay, but after a couple of weeks of that, they realize it's still too dangerous and they can't keep on hiding him like that. So as a family, they make the decision to flee. They pack up very little because they have such a long way to travel. The more they have to carry, the slower the journey will be. So they only pack up a few things and they set off. They're going to walk from North Korea to South Korea where it's safer, which is a long way, my friends. It'd be like us walking from Pennsylvania down to Virginia or North Carolina, maybe even further, on foot. Okay, can you imagine how badly your feet would hurt? Could you imagine if you had to do that in the dead of winter? It'd be really, really hard. But they have no choice, and that's what they do. And they begin their journey, and they're trudging along, finding shelter along the way, places to rest, to stop, and eat, and sleep. But they're making their way along with hundreds of other families who are trying to escape as well. But then all of a sudden, one night, while they are walking, a huge, loud, thunderous boom and bang um, is heard, and a scary light flashes across the sky. Can you guess what's happening? That's right, a bomb goes off, and this bomb changes everything. Because during all this chaos, when the bomb goes off and people are scattering, it's mass chaos. Sora is separated from her parents and her baby brother. So she still has her one brother, they're holding hands, but the rest of her family is gone. They're separated. Put yourself in that situation. What is she to do? She doesn't know if she should stay put and hope that they come back to find her. But that's probably not safe. They probably should keep moving, just keep going south and hope that they reunite later. Part of her says, maybe I should just go back home, right? Because that's one place that they know, you know, that's their home. So maybe that's where they'll go to find her. But that seems too dangerous too. In a panic, she just keeps grabbing her brother's hand and they keep moving south. A lot happens. Um, and I don't want to tell you too much. I'm going to stop right there. This is a very captivating, um, thrilling, sad at times, but also, you know, inspirational, just a, a moving story about Sora and her family. You'll have to read it to see if they survive, to see if they're reunited. 
and to learn more about the Korean War. This book, Boys and Girls, is also a Children's Choice Award nominee. You may have heard of Children's Choice before. We call it CCA for short. This title is um, one of eight titles that were selected for this year. So should you choose to participate in CCA, and you can do that if you're a third, fourth, fifth, or sixth grader, you're invited to participate. Should you want to participate, you can find out more information on a bookmark that's available at your school library or at the local public library. And that, that bookmark will have all the information you need to participate. But just know that this is one of the books and there's eight books in all. If you read four out of the eight, um, and if you can read more, great. But if you read at least four out of the eight, we ask you to vote for your favorite one come March. And then the voting takes place in March and then we announce the winner shortly afterwards. But we really encourage you to read these books because they're all great. Again, four out of the eight will allow you to vote and it'll put you in a drawing for a $50 Amazon gift card. So that's a little incentive for you to pick up one of those bookmarks too and get started reading today. I hope I've intrigued you maybe just a little bit to at least try this genre out. Historical fiction may not be for you because it's not for everybody, but it's really good to try new things, right? And to try as many different books as you can. So um, I'm gonna leave you today with a few more recommendations, but these will be done via book trailer. So see what you think and then come check one out today. Thanks everyone, I'll see you soon.